software update. So we are here, we are live, ready to go, ready to paint. So super excited. Yet again, by popular demand, Caroline is here with us tonight. Hi. And so is Alex, my, my, my trusty sidekick here. So, or me, his sidekick, <laughs> either way. But we're really excited. We're gonna be painting passion fruit tonight. And it was set up by Caroline. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, I'm putting out a challenge for anyone who can send us a painting that's been done in the past, especially if you can find one that looks like, you know, 19th century or earlier of passion fruit, because I, we were sitting there talking about it. We can't find or know of anyone Never. who's ever painted passion fruit. Yeah. So, uh, so hopefully maybe we're the first. So, uh, but if you do find one, send it to us, let us know about it. Also, if you want to paint along, our reference images are on YouTube. Uh, click on the comments below. You'll see a link. And if you've enjoyed doing, watching all of these uh, YouTube videos of ours, consider subscribing, clicking the bell, and that way you're always alerted to even our glitches when they happen. But They're you're fun. alerted to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you're alerted to uh, any time that we are going to go live and do something different. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. And we will go a little longer tonight so that we have time to finish. But uh, at least I will. I can't volunteer, y'all. But it, they might, yeah. you know. So okay. we're going to be around. Um, ask us questions. We would love to, to uh, answer any questions you have or to create uh, good conversation. And uh, later on, Nick will also be joining us and giving Divya a break. So we basically have two commentators in the back. So if y'all haven't yet, make sure your mics are unmuted. All right. The only good thing about a still life is, is you don't have to do 20 minute on and five minute breaks. So we can make up for a little bit of the lost time. Does everything seem to be going well, Divya? Just a quick question. Okay. How's your Monday going? Yeah. <laughs> Just stop. Um, my Monday is going. Is today Monday? Good. I think it's going fine. That's good. <laughs> I always uh, get sad because in order to like fix these issues, you have to like create a whole new program on Facebook and YouTube. And everybody's like got the link for the old program and they don't know what's going on and it's quite confusing and disorienting. But hopefully you've made it your way back to the newest program because it took us like three or four tries to figure it out. So God bless technology, but also it's like one of those things where you can't live with it and you can't live without it. Mm -hmm. All right. The old passion fruit. Does anybody know where the, like the original ori origins of passion fruit, like what, where it is indigenous? I need to. Nope. Maybe that's one of the reasons it hadn't been painted that much. It's such an exotic fruit. Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe I should have done research. <laughs> um, I feel like it would be something that's very tropical. Yeah. I don't know. I always think of be something that's like sort of near the equator and like somewhere in the Asia area, like Indonesia or something. I do wonder why it's called passion fruit. That's a good question. All right, so these are lots of different call outs to, to our audience. Look up these answers. Let <laughs> us know for an opportunity for everyone to learn. So I gotta figure out how, what kind of composition I'm gonna make here. So where's everyone coming or tuning in from? Let us know. So one lady originally when we had the first live stream going, it was from Australia, which is Divya's homeland. 
hope you're still joining us. I hope you had the patience to, to bear through everything. We have um, have uh, Le Lex Levi from New York and Chicago. Uh, Carol L. Zach from Chicago and Carla Donfororia from Los Angeles. Right. Well, we're, we're, we're at least covering our corners of the, of the U.S., <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Tonight, I think I'm going to start with the broad brush and work my way down. I, I, it's like I put out all the colors, but then I'm like, oh, I think I'm going to be a limited color palette today. Hmm. It's like, oh, man. I just wasted all the other colors. I'm sure I'll find a use for them. Be funny if I was just like, you know what, I'm going to paint apples. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we have seen like passion fruit paintings and we just thought they were apples. Yeah, I didn't really know what they were. I don't. I didn't know this is what passion fruit even looked like until I got to the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. It's funny because I actually thought of it being a bit more, yet again, I think just because I thought it was like a tropical fruit and because of the name, I thought it'd be more like a, a bit more exotic looking, but it just looks, it looks like a very round apple until you cut it open. Then you realize it's very different. Oh, yeah. Lexi says, uh, can you please talk about and demonstrate what you think about when you make a string? Do you find the form color first? Is there an order for creating a color string? Thanks. Um, so the color, when you said the form color first, is that what you said? The, the, do you find the color or the value first? Is that what you, no, you mean? Um, what you think when you make a string? Do you Find the um, form color first. Yes, correct. Okay. Well, uh, if, if it's definitely a string of, of a certain color, say that I'm trying to go around, say, a piece of passion fruit or something, what I tend to do is I find what is the like most light facing color to the light that I feel like it's going to have its truest local, val local color. And local color just means what is what we know the object to actually be the color of if it was an even light. Um, and so from there, I then work my way downward, either warmer or cooler, depending on if your light source is warm or cool and your shadow being warm or cool. And um, work my value down from there as well. So first things first, I try to get just the value of the ribbon down from the original color. And then um, also consider either the complement if I need to neutralize the color as it goes away, which is typically the case. So, um, but there's also like all sort of, sorts of like surrounding atmosphere that can change the color, but that's mainly what I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm putting out of like a ribbon. Caroline, since you have some ribbons out, how do you do it? <laughs> Um, I actually start with my darkest darks, like, and I kind of, because when I start painting, I like to paint with the, start the shadows first so that I can establish my darkest dark. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I mix my colors, I go up to my lightest light and um, I try to remember to stay pretty chromatic. Like I want to keep my colors rich until it hits that light point and then I can add in like my whites for my highlights are like if, um, like right now on the passion fruit, there's some moments where it's like kind of dusty, not like plums though, but there are moments where it will need some white in it. So um, 
I have my whites all the way at the top for my highlights. Yeah. Gotcha. Good question. Um, ribbons are such a great way of organizing your palette. You know, it's one of the first mm -hmm. things we talk about when we get when when um, we have new people here is how to establish control of your color palette by mixing ribbons. Mm -hmm. So it's not the end all be all, but it is a very important tool. It definitely helps me organize my thoughts. I feel more prepared to start a painting when I have all my paint mixed. Mm -hmm. um, instead of like kind of frantically mixing as I go. Um, so I'll just, and it's also nice because then you get to sit and spend time just like looking at your subject for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. And really trying to get the color accurate and uh, it just saves me a lot of grief later on. <laughs> oh yeah. Right now I'm just trying to establish where I want things to be in this composition. You know, by just making a few lines here and there, it allows me to be able to just like, oh, uh, you know, I want to erase that. That didn't look quite like I wanted to. And the negative space isn't what I want it to be. Someone wrote, uh, Passiflora edulis is commonly known as passion fruit, is a vine species of passion flower native to su southern Brazil through Paraguay and northern Argentina. Oh, Look nice. at that. A South American fruit. I bet Nelly ate, like, ate it her whole life. <laughs> so Nelly Klein, Michael Klein's wife, she's from Argentina. So, shout out to all of you out there. Oh, I wonder if we have any Argentinian people tuning in. Thank you for um, looking that up, whoever that was. Yeah. They're all better because of it. Do you normally do your drawing in, what is that, burnt seed? No, that's, is that umber? It is transparent oxide brown. Oh, that's fancy. Just cause, and this is the first time I've ever used this color, so I guess that's um, in there all. Okay. But either with charcoal or raw umber, usually. Yeah. What are your favorite fruit to paint, Alex? Favorite food? Fruit. <laughs> it could also be your favorite food. <laughs> well, you know, I gotta say peaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. You kind of have to. Uh, they are, though. Peaches are pretty awesome. Yeah. They're really hard. They have, they're like dusty, but then have variations in color um, as like the form turns. So you have to handle value and chroma and a lot of different things. Lexi Levi asks, what amount of light is appropriate in a studio? Is it better to paint in a more or less light? Ah, that's a great question. Alex, you want to take that first and go around the room? I, w I mean, I wish I knew <laughs> the right answer. Um, uh, I'm thinking if there's somehow you could get like a good reproduction of a painting uh, like bring that into the light and feel like once you feel like it's lit well and not like too dark or too light but I mean I've heard of people painting in a studio that's slightly darker so that the painting ends up brighter and then I've heard of like other people that just like blast their canvas with light. Mm -hmm. um, like, pretty sure I've heard that like Jacob Collins some used to do that or something. Mm -hmm. Just like blast his canvas with light. So I, I don't know, but yeah, if you can get a good, nice, evenly lit canvas, you can kind of feel if it's too dark. I think. One way of saying I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either because you you want to have it be evenly lit. Um, you definitely don't want to be straining your eyes too much. Um, I like working from north facing windows because I feel like you get really nice light on your subject matter. But then, like when you have those days where it's like cloudy out and um, you end up straining your eyes a lot. So I don't know whether or not you should sacrifice your eyesight for nice light. Mm, that's true, because I mean, I've, yeah, I've painted like from life next to a window and like the point of it was to be kind of a dark thing. So I'm kind of painting in the dark and, but then I've been in full light. Oh, I heard myself echo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'll, I'll take home. It's so funny because I was telling everybody tonight that, <clears throat> you know, I felt like we, we were really good because we were kind of ahead of the game and typically I'm always frantically running around <laughs> trying to get everything ready in time. And then we had all these like glitches and like I keep finding that we, we still have like a few glitches going here and there. <laughs> so, you know, I forgot to knock on some wood. That's all I can say. Okay. Oh, yeah. Come. 
lips. Do you have some of that? <laughs> now that I yep. actually have to do it. Did you touch yeah. anything? No, I promise. I was just looking at the light. Yep, and that's Gary. <laughs> I wish I still remembered how to do an ellipse. Because I remember I watched a carpenter video on how to draw an ellipse and I forgot now. <laughs> But you need math more than you want to need math and art. Oh, it's at a pool connection. It's a pool connection you're referring to. What? What the heck? Okay, these are harder than I thought that they would be. All right, everybody, we're still running into some glitches in the system. So we will continue going forward. I'm going to try to switch it over to Alex's program. So, um, so just bear with us. We're, I'll see if I can switch it over to Alex. There we go. And, um, and I will we'll be right back with you. I'm, we're going to mute it until I get it figured out for a second. Is <laughs> that me, Gary? <Google? laughs> <laughs> wow. Sorry. Okay. All right, we're 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 going, y'all. Uh, we're we're just it's crazy with all the things that are going on here, but we are on. <laughs> so um, it's funny everyone else could see what was going on, but our control center couldn't see what was going on. So I think that's time for Sling Studio to do a software update. <laughs> Good question has come from figurative, figurative artist Benjamin Lester. Can you tell if a painting is done from life by looking at it? Oh. Mm. Uh, I used to think so. And like quite a few years ago, I'd be like, oh, no, that's painting from life. And then especially when it's people who are who are alive today, and then you realize, because you actually find it, like, meet them, or hear about people who know them, and a lot of the stuff you thought was painting, painting from life wasn't. So I would say no, because I think there's so much more to making a painting feel alive than just if there's a model in front of you yeah. or not. It's great. I agree with that. Great comment. Um, I would say that depending on if the person's trained or not, you can tell sometimes whether they did or didn't. But there's, it's not often that you can tell whether a trained person did or didn't because mm -hmm. oftentimes they're using maybe even tropes that happen to have artifacts that look like it come from a photograph that are part of their style where it actually was done from life. A, a good example is Joe McGurl. I could have sworn painted his stuff from photo just because of how he, he controls light sometimes, looks very photo-y, and yet he, he strictly only paints from life or mm -hmm. his imagination. Mm -hmm. and, and so like you know, he's, he, he's an example of someone at, at, at times I was like, this looks incredibly cool, but, you know, it almost looks like it's a photograph, and yet it's, it's 
painted from life and is super cool that some of it is done from his head and mm -hmm. looks like he most certainly was staring at something. So, um, and then you've got other people who have such life training and understand how to like manipulate an illusion mm -hmm. that comes from typically you, something you would be trained from life that was done from a photo. So I agree with you. A tr from a trained artist, it's hard to be able to tell sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess it would kind of be like you can tell or not if the person has ever painted from life. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can, you can tell for sure. I think when I went to the Met and I saw that um, Lepage painting, I think, of Joan of Arc, mm -hmm. I did not, like, finding out that some of the naturalists used um, photography blew my mind because I would not have thought, I don't know if he used photography yeah. for that specific one, but I would not have thought that looking at it. Yeah, and, and there was a post recently, I think it was Jerome that somebody posted about a photo reference that he used for a fountain in one of his paintings. Oh. <laughs> and, um, but the cool thing was is that sometimes, which I think would be great for all artists to, to do and know, is that he, he changed the whole perspective of the fountain that he got mm. from the photo reference. Mm -hmm. He changed, you know, the whole, it was, it was implanted in a wall in his painting versus it being like a standalone fountain in the other one. Is this like truth coming out of the Of fountain? the well? Yeah. No, no it's okay. a different one. It's a okay. different one. But, um, you know, and you, I think that like a few of the things that he kept was like the rim of the fountain and then like out the water spout as it came out of the wall. Mm -hmm. But... Almost everything else about it was different, you know? Yeah. So, um, which was another really interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think that, like, I have, like, the solely from life thing is so interesting because if you, if you say anything about it, it makes you seem like you're defending like painting solely from just photography, but it's situations like that where I feel like we're missing the big picture of the shit that we should be learning. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, yeah, that. And then we were looking at something in an Andrew Loomis book yeah. the other day and he just, he did the composition the in like four different yeah. perspectives. The lady who you just the redrew piano. it in four different perspectives. Like yeah. From yeah. Up here, looking like from below, above at it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like an awesome book to read it through because he actually explains form really well in that book, like how to think about form in the beginning. And yeah. that's the one you're reading, right, so, Caroline? I read that for a bit. Yes. Go for it, Diva. Actually, oh, sorry, rifting off that um, point about form, do you think that's like one key thing that you could tell if it was um, done from life or not? Because, you know, apparently photos flatten things or whatever. Like if it feels formy or not? I, I mean, I've most certainly seen paintings that I thought were done from life that like had solid form that were done from yeah. a photo. Um, you know, it, it's harder to do because you're you're literally having to translate twice. But um, but no, I think it's I think it's possible. I think it's it's not as possible if you haven't had life training. Um, I think it's harder to learn how to do that without life training, but um, not impossible because it's it's just a scientific. It's just a, it's a hacking of your own mind of having, having to figure out how to make something feel dimensional, you know. Mm -hmm. So Caroline, um, Michelle says, Chris, Caroline, as someone who is also learning oil painting, 
what are some of the marks you have placed as you have been looking to grow your skill? The, uh, also, considering to always be learning and growing in your painting, but particularly in the beginning. So I think, yeah, maybe she's asking, um, yeah, what if, what did you do to grow your skill? Okay. Particularly in the beginning, I think. Well, I did a lot of, I did some cast drawing in the beginning um, when I studied with my first teacher and um, that was really just me learning the fundamentals of how to see, which is very important <laughs> um, with painting. Um, and then I just have done a lot of still life in the past and it helps, like still life is great for learning color and for um, learning form, at least for me, it's been great for learning form. Um, I have been working with oil paint since I was in high school, so I was pretty familiar with, with not everything about it, but I was familiar with just like using it. Um, so I would just say do a lot of still lives because it's great from life training. Um, and do a lot of drawing in the beginning because drawing is the foundation of everything for painting. Like if you, you can paint something really, really well, um, but if your drawing is off, <laughs> um, then it's pretty obvious. <laughs> so, yeah. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> start busting out the good. Alex. <laughs> Alex Tabet says, what are some essential things to keep in mind to make your painting look alive as though it were painted from life? Is it mostly about having a very realized sense of space, form and light? Well, I mean, you could take that term very realized and that could mean anything. Mm. It's like that could mean Make it look like it was painted from life. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really interesting. It's kind of like you just have to paint so many things from life that when you do paint from a photo, you just you understand certain things that you like. You see the photos doing it, and you're like, no. Any time I painted from life, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Like just certain mm. shadow things, certain like chroma things, things, uh, let's say if you're painting someone from a photo and it just kind of, even understanding what a blown out photo looks like, if it's like, is there even a skin tone there? Mm. Or is it just a white mm -hmm. thing? Um, yeah, but then, so, Stuff like that and then thinking about form and planes and stuff. I definitely but, think, oh sorry, you go ahead. No, I'm glad you're gonna. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think it's a lot easier to overdo reflected light or just like see reflected light more in a photograph. And oh, yeah. um, like a, you don't wanna have a lot of reflected light in your shadows or else it makes your shadows look flat. Or not flat that makes them look weird. I don't know the right terminology. Mm -hmm. That'll work. <laughs> yeah, flat, weird. weird. It weird. like brings them forward. Yeah. Um. So Lexi. Leave, Lex Levi says, any good re book recommendations for anatomy and form? Uh, definitely for form, there's a whole chapter in the Andrew Loomis book that I read through that I felt like explained form pretty well. Um, but take it with a grain of salt because he's talking about it from an illustrator's perspective. Um, he's not talking about it from... Um, like necessarily an oil painter's perspective, but he did study with Robert Bridgman, who I think he's written a lot of anatomy books. And then Robert Bridgman studied with, I think, Jerome. 
So there's some handing down of knowledge there that could mm. be correct. Um, and then, Louis, do you have any references for anatomy books? Man, there's there's actually a, a lot of them. Um, I, I I've actually been a fan of of Robert Beverly Hale's mm. um, series of books that he's created. He he did one with also like the French anatomy. If you want like a really uh, uh, like a he he did one with a French medical book that um, is sort of like the Bible of anatomy. If you if you were studying where I studied. Um, but there's quite a few, I mean, there's some really good, you know, if you're okay with like it being in Russian, there's actually some really good Russian ones that, um, I, I, I'll have to look up the names of them though. I can't think of the names and I actually don't own them. Um, you know, but, uh, I also actually have and feel like it does a great job of making it feel basic and un very understandable is is the new book anatomy for sculptors hmm. and they just do a great job of breaking things down into different forms and shapes so if you're a form painter it it, it actually makes a lot of sense um, what how their approach on things because you're able to like you know they always say form painters are, are thinking about scul being sculptors in space in, on a two-dimensional surface. You're trying to actually make something feel three-dimensional. So having those books like Anatomy for Sculptors, shout out to them, is I actually have really enjoyed looking over them and they think they do a really good job because it's for artists. But it's not traditional. It's It most certainly has like a high-tech feel to it, but I've found them helpful. I actually think I have a... What do you say? Oh. Go ahead, Divya. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Carol. No, you're fine. You go ahead. <laughs> no, no. It, uh, and Louie, I was just going to ask, when you say it's not traditional, do you mean it has that sort of like um, cut, that superhero kind of illustrated? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, actually not. Uh, because they actually do a good job of showing fats, th very thin, muscular, all the way through. So they show multiple different renditions. Uh, what I mean is it's not like... A drawing illustrated book it's all sort of computer generated images that they've uh, cut into different colored uh, muscle groups so that you can see the muscle groups better and so it, it's it's honestly incredibly legible uh, but it just doesn't have the same feeling as like one of those old school old you're not you're not reading a da Vinci manual you know mm -hmm. um, that's basically what I'm getting at <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, for still, uh, a lady writes for still life. I w would highly recommend the art of the still life, a contemporary guide to. Classical Technique, Composition, and Painting in Oil by Todd Casey. That, um, that book, one of our artist interns, Nick, has that book. And it seems very thorough. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to him for putting it together because that, that had to have taken him a lot of time to put that together. everyone's sort of projects at the moment? Well, at the moment, I, I've been really backed up on commission work, so I'm, I'm trying to play catch-up right now. So just a whole lot of portraits um, at the moment. And, you know, then, then I can do some, you know, projects that are, projects that are in my head but right now, I have to kind of, you know, stay true to my commitments. But Alex, what do you have going on, buddy? Nothing much. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my 
solo exhibition at Arcadia Contemporary Whoa. Uh, is opening November 13th, I believe. So I'm at the, yeah, the last leg of that, and I've been doing a lot of the, the work that doesn't involve much painting, like photographing the art and framing and all that stuff. And yeah, like the most fun part of all of it, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's... I'm sure I've complained on here before about photographing artwork. It's just so difficult. So, but the end is near, so it's exciting in that regard. Yeah, been working really hard at this show for a while now. You see Alex coming in day in and day out. You know, just starting a painting, finishing a painting, and then setting it aside and starting a painting and finishing a painting. Um, so it's always fun to see him come near the end of that journey and start prepping for it. Yeah, I'm kind of um, I'm trying to just finish all of the prep stuff so that I could potentially squeeze in one more painting before mm. the show, but that might be wishful thinking right there. It could happen. Good. And then I'll disappear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Elvis did a great job of like disappearing. Tupac did a great job of disappearing right at the height. Is that, is that what we should be expecting? All of a sudden, there it, Alex is no more. And that way you like, just end on top. Like dying? You're, yeah. You're, <laughs> <laughs> Tupac oh, didn't dying, die. Right. Elvis didn't die. That's true. I think that's all, all a conspiracy that they died. <laughs> that's true. That is a true 100% fact. <laughs> <laughs> that you I mean, can't argue. Nope. Can't argue. They faked their own death so that they could like make even more money off of their work. We all know this. Well, actually, um, that is an interesting point. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife's about to knock you off, man. <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> I was reading a, well, we're reading a book called Pal by Robert Greene right now. And I think this is relevant to what you're talking about, but it was, Last night I was reading a chapter about how um, it's good to, for people to like disappear for a while because it can like gain your honor back, um, mm. and like a lot of people, I don't I don't know there was some like um, guy who was able to become king because people uh, recognized how good he was at I don't know I think he was like a like a justice person. And then he disappeared and it made the people appreciate him and then they wanted him to be king and it was all part of his plan. And yeah, it was this, because he like disappeared and anyways, um, yeah, it was like that. talking about that and how like if you give people too much, like I think it was talking about your career or I was also talking about love, I don't know. It was this whole chapter about it, but that it can, um, yeah, it, then people will expect it. So you need to like disappear for a while and yeah, yeah. what an interesting chapter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually think that's a good, a good point. Alex, you need to disappear, man. You just watch. <laughs> He's yeah. getting ready for his disappearance. Yep, mm -hmm. he's going to be Alex Houdini. <laughs> I guess he was more of an escape artist than disappearing act. <laughs> that works too. He yeah, escape. Oh, um, who's the other guy, the gothic magician? <laughs> oh, Chris Angel? <laughs> yeah. Mind freak? 
Boy, he, he, he had his, like, just hot weird. minute. Yeah, he really just disappeared. <laughs> maybe he's trying to, like, wait for his comeback. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's super strategic. Yeah. That would be so funny. I doubt he could make a comeback. Man, can you imagine? Probably in jail for something. <laughs> <laughs> for being a freak. Yeah. Are you ready? I would hate that, though. Have that kind of person in the jail. I can read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Or like, yeah, you're his cellmate and you kind of wake up in the middle of the night and he's outside of the cell. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, bro, how'd you get out? Can't hold me in here. So, um, Natalia uh, Dib says, Natal Dib says, maybe I take you out of context, but recently I see a webinar about art education, guide to classical... Sorry, maybe I take you out of context, but recently I see a webinar about art education. Could you reflect about art education from your point of view as artists? Do you think she means like the art school, like higher education of college? Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Art Basically, our experience of, oh yeah, that is true. I don't know how to translate that. Mm. Um, yeah, she said yes, she said yes. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, oh. <laughs> 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 all right. Um, so which one of y'all like to take that <laughs> now that this clear? <laughs> Um, Alex and I actually went to the same art college. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. So VCU Rams. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, <laughs> Two VCU Ram dropouts right here. <laughs> <laughs> Go Rams. Yeah. <laughs> and what was your experience? <laughs> Uh, it was it's a cool place to hang out, mm -hmm. um, but you don't learn you don't learn skills. Uh, well, you don't learn these very the very specific kind of skills that I wanted to learn and Caroline yeah. wanted to learn. They were not teaching them no. at VCU. Mm. Yeah. And there's just so many uh, different ways to go about getting that education but that is not, that is better than the university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get an education at a university, get, get something in the business field like a marketing degree. Yeah. Something that you can use to go towards your art um, to pay off your student loans. Right. Your student debt. Because worst case scenario, that, that, uh, that art degree or that uh, marketing degree can be translated to some other type of field. But you most certainly can use it in your art field if you want to try to make it as an artist. Um, but I don't think, I think a lot of people waste their money, including myself, in getting an art degree. I got an art degree at a college. And, um, as far as learning a, a skill set for painting, I didn't, I didn't learn much. Uh, I learned a lot about other aspects that um, the world and culture finds important in the art field. But um, I didn't, and I actually learned a, a few skills in sculpture because we had a classical sculptor there. But uh, aside from that, you know, you, you learn to explain yourself well. And a large amount of the art field is that. When was the point for you guys when you were at art college and you signed up for it and you realized that you weren't really learning like to anything? Or like, you know, you learn a little bit, sure, but like, when was that point? 
Uh, I, I mean, for me, you were learning, you weren't learning what you thought you would learn. Um, so, but the thing that I thought I was going to learn, I already could do better than the instructor, which not only was, <laughs> was kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm not getting out much out of this as far as like technique is concerned. Um, but also at, at times had posed a threat to the instructor and was not healthy as a student because um, you had to kind of watch, watch how you presented yourself. And I don't know if I presented myself the best way uh, in my younger years. So, <laughs> so um, but you know, that, that's, that would say that was part of what made me go, I'm, yeah, I'm not learning much here. Um, I did learn a decent amount about art history. We had good art history teachers there. And getting an education in the other fields, I think, allows for you to be able to be educated to know how to have a conversation with anyone. Because you're going to run into a situation where contemporary or modern people will share a paradigm with you that you might not have an answer to if you haven't educated yourself on that paradigm as well. So. For those reasons, I think it is important and helpful. Because you can also incorporate that into your traditional way of painting. You know, that, that just adds to the poetry of how you want to not only paint, but also what you want to say. Because they emphasize a lot on what is it you want to say. Yeah. Natalie says, we will... That's, that is right. We were learning not what we expected. Nice way to say it. Well, I never know when a former teacher's listening in. <laughs> Two. <laughs> yeah, it's really finding what makes you feel happy and fulfilled. And when I was at art school, I felt neither of those things. Mm. <laughs> I felt deeply unfulfilled and... Um, like I didn't really know what I was doing ever. Like I always felt confused. Um, and then one day, I don't know if I've told my sister this, but she got a dog and named the dog Nix. And that is the, this dog is like a fully black lab mix. And um, Nix is the Greek goddess of night. So I looked up an image or like I looked that up on Wikipedia and the image that they use for that is a Bouguereau painting. And it's one of those beautiful paintings in that series that he did of, um, what was it? It was dawn, day, dusk, night. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, that was the first time I'd ever seen a Bouguereau painting. <laughs> and it just, like, really spoke to me. And I was like, why aren't we doing paintings like this anymore? Mm. And then it kind of opened up a whole rabbit hole. And so basically the reason why I'm here is because of my sister's dog. Actually, that is a great story. <laughs> I love Thanks, that. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, but it was a really good learning experience for me to go to art school. Um, I learned a lot about myself, about like my limits, and what I learned about what I didn't want to do, which is important. Yeah. Yeah. What about for you guys? When was the like point where you were like, um, it's time? To, like um, when did you, yeah. I was a, a sophomore and I was going to go into my junior year, and I was just very unhappy. <laughs> I didn't really know what was going on with myself. Like I didn't know where my art would take me. I was like a I was a double major in sculpture and painting and there was a lot about it that was really amazing like they the art school there has a glass blowing studio I never got to do glass blowing but I did some welding I did some foundry I did like I did a bunch of stuff and it was really really cool um, but it wasn't me worth like it wasn't worth it for me to stay there and spend that money on tuition for me to not really know what was going on 
Yeah. So um, that was when I got in touch with uh, this artist named Henry Wingate, and he invited me to be a studio or a studio a student in his studio um, and learn from him in like an apprenticeship mentorship, and that kind of started my whole journey here. Um, and I don't regret going to art school just because I learned a lot there for what I don't want to do with my life. And that's very important to learn. Yes. Because then otherwise, like, you'll have regrets, you'll have doubts. Um, and I have no regrets and I have no doubts. <laughs> well said. What about you, Alex? You know, I can't, I can't, like, I know that, I mean, I only made it one semester, so I know that somewhere in there I started to have doubts, but then the end of the year project, I had to do a, I, what's it called? Oh, performative art? Yeah, performative like art piece. Studio. Yeah, in public. And it had to be filmed, and I was already thinking about how this wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, <laughs> not happening. I'm mm -hmm. not going to do that. Yeah. And that was like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. But, yeah, I could see that being the crux. Yeah, I think life is short and it shouldn't. I don't know, waste time or money doing something that um, doesn't make you really happy, especially if it's like your education. Oh, actually, now I remember. Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> now I remember. Another like key moment was that my like philosophy teacher showed us this video and talk to us about how most art graduates just end up working at an art store or like a coffee shop. And he was just saying, I basically like, you need to be here because you wanna be here, not because you think that it's gonna get you that yeah. magic job or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I thought like that was that was real, yeah. and that, that hit me. Yeah, that's deep. Yeah, I mean, like, I remember when um, I was applying to colleges and I got into University of Michigan, and I was really excited about that school, and we went and talked to like their admissions officers or something like that, and um, I remember her telling me that the chances of supporting yourself as a professional artist is like the same chances of somebody going pro with football. And like me hearing this as like a 17 year old so girl going true. into like, yeah, like <laughs> I was 17 and I was so excited about art and like my future was ahead of me. And to hear that was so discouraging. And um, I think your odds of are greater than becoming pro football <laughs> than going to pro football but it was just really it was really interesting i think it's a good reality to tell people it's hard you yes. know but but it is not pro football or pro nba you know uh hard it's your competition isn't like that crazy i think one of the things that to make it to like the level where you're making NBA money, yeah, probably oh, yeah. so. Yeah. That that's probably true. But um, no, there there's a especially in our day and age. Now a couple of, you know ten years ago, it might or twenty years ago, it might have been a bit harder. But in our day and age, with the technologies we have to get our names out there and be our own sort of PR. No, uh, you, you can totally do it. Um, so. I wish you were there when I was 17 and hearing those, <laughs> those words. Well, the other thing is, is that Great. as a modern painter, uh, it might be that hard. Yeah. Uh, but as a classical painter, I think that, I think you actually have a, a, a larger audience in, in some instances, you know. 
um, to, to make it and get into Art Basel, that's kind of a hard thing to do, you know? Because mm. um, it's, it's just like photography. You know, it's hard to be a photographer because it just everyone can get up and take shots and you have to know how to self-promote yourself really well and, and do all the other things in order to make it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think real, painting realism or whatever you want to call this is way more objective, mm. which makes it a lot easier yeah. yep. than trying to convince someone your stuff is good. Yep. They can look at it and know if it's good or not. So it's just up to you to, to actually do a good job of trying to make things look good. And just a shout out to everyone on the Instagram Live to head over to the YouTube channel where you can ask questions. Yes, come join us, ask questions. Let's hang out, paint along with us. We have reference images too. And uh, SV, like not, not the letters, it's, it looks like first name S, last name V. Uh, maybe it's just being clever, I, I don't know. Uh, th they say, uh, trying to imagine Alex doing performance art in public setting, LOL. I try to imagine it too. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I, you know, uh, Alex told me earlier that he was going to do an interpretive dance of the Song of Solomon from the Bible um, later. So everybody tune in for that. Yes, that is a promise. But that was a promise I heard. <laughs> but I'll be wearing goat horns and you get <laughs> a pentagram to my chest. <laughs> um, dark jokes. Pool balls. <laughs> actually, these are actually really hard. Thanks, Caroline. You're welcome. I was like, oh, these are so pretty. I'll get this done in 30 minutes. I know. I was like, I'm actually excited to paint these. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> actually very hard. Plums are a lot easier than this. I have this like eerie feeling that we're being watched. <laughs> <laughs> Divya lurking. Yep. It's a certain presence in the room. I mean, oh, yeah. I do realize we're, <laughs> we're doing a, like a live stream with the cameras. But the cameras is one thing. I keep feeling like something approaches me closely. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm wearing the right shoes for this. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would congratulate them on being strong enough to do that. Yeah. Because <laughs> my feet hurt and yeah, my back hurts. <laughs> that would be insane. Hey, my, my cowboy boots have like about like inch and a half, yeah. two inch heel, you know, so uh, that, that's that's close enough. <laughs> he is our closest heel person <laughs> in the house. Um, I mean, he. I, I hear he could qualify for Kinky Boots if he wanted to be on their <laughs> Broadway show. <laughs> so, to be reminding me to keep my posture. <laughs> we'll have we'll have uh, after the interpretive dance. We'll have uh, Nick do a runway walk with his with his boots on. Make sure his Savannah, his fiance Savannah has a front row seat. <laughs> this is Nick's performative art. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. On a serious note, we do have a question. Uh, we have a, the subject. You know, it's like a Monty Python. You know, and now something completely different. <laughs> you know. So we have a question from Gail who asks, uh, do you prefer to paint the focal point first and then the rest of the canvas? 
Uh, today, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. I'm, I'm kind of um, painting the first thing I see. I, I feel like I'm a little bit frazzled from all of the issues that went on so at the earlier. So I'm just kind of like, but, well, we're going to just start here because we're going to start here. But maybe there's a, much, a little bit more strategy with uh, Alex and Caroline. No. <laughs> <laughs> These things are, I paint very differently right now than I normally do. Because I'm like, I have to get everything on there. <laughs> um, but normally I paint a little bit a little more slowly. And um, I like to form model a lot. And um, I do try to think about the whole. Um, but this is a little bit more rushed than how I normally paint. So, yeah. But I do think it's important to get your background in, or like your darkest darks in, so that you could set um, your values for the rest of the painting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Something like that. That's that's about right. Yeah. No, no, all, all of us are like, uh huh. Yep, different. Yep. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. But yeah, the 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 idea of starting from the focal point. I definitely used to paint more like that when I wanted to be more Richard Schmid esque. I would just like start painting an eye without oh, any wow. drawing or anything. <laughs> wow, that's bold. And then just go from like eye to eye. Yeah, I think in his, in Richard Schmidt's book, uh, he will actually like do like a very loose block in, like line block in, and he would actually like draw like a line for where he wants the eye to travel through it. And then I think he would actually start at the focal point and then kind of trail along. I, mean, I don't know if he did it for every one of his paintings, but that was something he at least had as a technique in his book. Hmm. Well, everyone needs to come join us over at the YouTube place. Come on to the YouTube channel, East Oak Studio. Come hang out with us. We have a lot of conversation. Now, if it's interesting conversation, I don't know, <laughs> it, but we have a lot of it. <laughs> Richard asks, uh, are you using cobalt blue? I don't know which person he's talking to, but if anybody is using cobalt blue, or if anybody is not using cobalt blue, that might be interesting as well. I don't know. <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using French ultramarine and cobalt. Um, so, um, along with a myriad of other colors as well. And I am not using cobalt. But I, on a lot of my paintings, I do use it. I don't ever use it. <laughs> it I, used to be on mine. <laughs> I've just seen Donald Journey has, um, by the way, I joined his Instagram. Oh, DJ. Sorry, sorry, Caroline. Oh, no, you're fine. You Donald Journey is more important than my Cobalt Blue <laughs> um, comment. Um, I don't use it. I. I have a spot for it on my palette, but that was for a landscape painting. Mm -hmm. I don't ever use it when I paint. I just use um, ultramarine blue now. I think that's my only blue, actually. Um, I actually never used a cobalt blue until about a year or two ago. Um, I had it on my palette for a long time, and I just was scared to use it, I think. Um, Why were you scared of it? I I think you just get used to colors and sometimes you forget mm -hmm. to experiment with them and you kind of don't know where to and usually I'm like the level of importance in this painting I can't experiment right now. Oh yeah. And so um, I think it was a kind of combination of all those things. Yeah. But then um, 
I experimented with it a couple of times and I, I liked a color that it was producing that was similar to a color I was trying to get or achieve mm -hmm. using French Ultramarine and I liked it better. And so I started using it a lot more in my work. So moral of the story, experiment, try new things. Um, you, you might have pleasant surprises. On, on a similar note, uh, I, I know that like some artists will do like a, they'll have like a, a cool version of the color and then like a, a warmer version or some will have like a, you know, chromatic and another that's neutral. Do you have any, anything like that that y'all do in picking which colors you want on your palette? Yeah, um, on my, on my actual full palette that I use when I'm doing studio work and, or just full palette stuff, I have almost a transparent, a transparent version, a transparent dark version of the color, and then a well, I have a cold, like a cold version and a warm version, and one of those versions are usually, um, I also try and have an opaque light and a dark transparent. So like alizarin crimson and cad red. The alizarin is colder and it's dark and transparent and the cad red is warmer and brighter. And then um, I have transparent oxide yellow and then I also have a more neutral yellow that is like a yellow ochre and then I'll have sometimes like a cad yellow that's more chromatic so yeah and then raw umber would be a dark uh, less chromatic yellow so yeah my, my, I feel like my brain's working slow the yep. moment trying to paint but Mm -hmm. But yes. I feel like the same though. I feel like my brain's working slow too. I feel like I'm playing catch up here. I feel like my brain's always working slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is kind it's of like rubbing things. your belly and patting your head. Yeah. You know, this whole thing that we're doing. And uh, Richard followed up on that uh, question about cobalt blue, and he said, it's been a color I've seen recently and wanted to try just because it is so different from ultramarine. Another thing to add with what Alex is saying is that you can also play with opacity and transparency. Um, I don't know if when I was concentrating, I missed if you said that or not, Alex, but mm -hmm. usually I'll have one color that's cooler lower or higher in value and more opaque and then I'll have the other one be more transparent higher or lower in value and warmer you know depending on you know just basically have all sort of the contrasts in them and it just gives you opportunity to make interesting things happen in your work so cobalt blue for example is is um, lighter, more opaque, and um, I guess you would say it was cooler depending on who you ask, you know, um, because blue, some people think that you go towards the green way, it's cool or warm, and then the other way is warm or cool, so. Um, are, do you, either one of y'all in a certain camp with that? Do y'all think a, like a more purpley blue is warmer or cooler? And do you think the opposite, more of a greeny blue is warmer or cooler? Mm -hmm. I think I just categorize them by green blue or <laughs> purple blue. Well, that, and that's, that's actually what I tell people in my workshop. That, that mm -hmm. exact thing is don't stop worrying about whether one's warm or what, one's, one's cool. Just know that one's one type of temperature hue and then the other one's the other 
you know, because um, people get so hung up on whether it's warm or cool, they forget to start painting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know? really, it's like, use the blue in your cools. Right. Probably not in your warms. Um, yeah, I remember an artist, like, a couple of years ago having a whole debate about whether there can be a warm and cool blues. Oh, that's interesting. And he was basically saying, one, no, and two, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, that's, the camp, that's the camp I'm in, too. Yeah, at least when it comes to blue. I agree. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Just know there's a difference. And so be yourself a, a world of issue. I wonder if, like, maybe part of, like, why people may disagree about this, and this is complete speculation, uh, but I wonder if it is, like, maybe a difference between portrait painters and landscape painters, because landscape painters are dealing a lot with greens. And so as something comes out of like the shadows into the light, they're going to be turning, you know, probably more towards yellows and greens. Um, whereas if somebody's a portrait painter, like there's going to be a bit more purples or something that are going to be contrasting with it or something. And so sort of the, the way out of the coolest notes, is either going to be in one direction around the color wheel or the other. Donald Journey. You know, tune back in, Donald. <laughs> if y'all don't know Donald Journey's work, you got to look it up. He's he's an incredible painter and a dear friend of the East Oaks family. We love having him here. We recently did a, a tutorial video. He's done two two with us. One of them was for the imaginary, the imaginary landscape because he paints all of his work from imagination, or a lot of his work. He does do plein air work, but a lot of his work he does from imagination. And, um, and then to couple with that, he did an interior, the imagined interior. And it was a blast. It was so much fun to do that with him. And if he does one more, we'll have to call it the three tutorial. That's it. Jack Ladies and gentlemen, jokes. Nick will be here all night. Yeah. <laughs> he just flew in from Chicago, and boy, are his arms tired. <laughs> three tutorial. Oh, Nick keeps us entertained with his fantastically corny dad jokes all the time. He's been. He's a true dad in training. He's not a dad, but the, at, at his rate, his increased fertility continues to go up <laughs> with every joke he tells. And now for something entirely different. Uh, Alex has a question. Uh, he says, how long did it take for y'all to start really nailing proportions during the drawing stage consistently and quickly? I feel like I'm decent at it, but it always takes me a long time with lots of corrections. Hmm. You know, I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, it's still a long time with a lot of corrections for me. Yeah. yeah. I can, I mean, I think everyone can, I can third that, you it's, know. It's just it's, like something you need to keep up with. Well, like even if you get it down, you have to like keep retraining your eyes. And let that be an encouragement, not a discouragement, right. that it's just something that you continue to exercise and you'll never feel necessarily like you've got it, but that you're in the same boat with everyone who's a professional painter, um, that it's, it's probably one of the most quintessential things that you've got to keep practicing um, forever. I think it comes... It's one of the few things that come a bit more naturally to me, but I have to make a, mid, a bajillion correct, corrections all the time still. And just because I'm, I might do it slightly faster doesn't mean that I, I nail it. Um, and one of the beauties of doing a still life is like, you know, I can fudge it a little bit and be okay. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about it as much but when you're doing portraits, you, you know, you got 
you got to be on your A game because everything depends on that. As far as lightness is concerned, everything depends on the drawing. Yeah, fruit is very forgiving. <laughs> so when, when people are like, yeah, how about y'all do another still life? We're like, yes, mm -hmm. we'll do another still life. <laughs> it's got its own challenges, but um, it does allow you to, to, to ease your brain a little bit on the drawing part of it. Tell you what, when, when you see other people like, you know, say Richard Schmidt or somebody who can just whip out one of these ala primas, though, um, and he, he'd probably be done by now. I'm done. Um, your hat's tipped off to him because he just makes it look so effortless. Good question though, Alex. I hope that that encourages you. Not you, Alex, the other Alex. <laughs> well, if Alex you needs some encouragement. You should be discouraged. I am. I'm skilled. <laughs> Uh, I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name. Um, oh, getting weird feedback. Um, so, uh, nice to hear your stories. It seems all the Western countries have changed in the 20th century to the same art education system, cutting with tradition and losing essential artistic trade techniques. Yeah, it's less about a trade, more about a concept. <laughs> It's like very intellectual now. Not yeah. that it wasn't before, but that seems to be the main foundation. Instead of technique, it's um, thought. Mm. It's like a creative writing degree, but <laughs> they decided to paint while they did it. Yep. It's like, what? Why? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because philosophy, I think, changes. And then in return, cult culturally speaking, um, in return, you know, your, the arts and expression of whatever the cultural philosophy of the time starts becoming expressed in the work. And, you know, Turn of the uh, turn of the century all the way through mid century, there's just been such an interesting evolution of philosophy that has then related it not only in the visual arts but also the performing, um, including music and and all the like. But one thing I think that holds true over time is that things that are truthful continue to resonate. And people continue to go back to uh, things that are, are not necessarily incredibly deep that you kind of get lost in, but that have sort of a primary truth attached to them. So, um, now that I'm starting to get deep. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I appreciate that comment. Uh, Mustafa says, amazing content for free and super amazing content, kind of for free on Atelier Live. Thank you so much. Just had to put that complimenting 
in there. <laughs> Mustafa, it's good to hear from you, buddy. Glad you're joining us. Mustafa, Mustafa has been one of our longtime subscribers and uh, cheerleaders, and always appreciate hearing from him. Yeah, I think last live stream, I think it was last live stream, he wasn't there, and afterwards we were like, we didn't hear from Mustafa. Where is he? That's true. You were missed. You were missed, <laughs> Mustafa. <laughs> Your passion fruit feel like? Do they have passion? Yes, they, they have do passion. have passion. <laughs> That's what I'm going for, oui, my oui. passion fruit to have passion. <laughs> Yes, she likes the passion. <laughs> oh yeah, when we were talking about cobalt blue, I feel like if I had to get rid of a blue, I could get rid of ultramarine. Oh, mm. really? Because I feel mm. like the only reason I use it is in like darks, like for shadows. Mm -hmm. And I could just use black with like my warm brown. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's I mean, kind of look the same. I actually don't use black anymore. That's funny. I use blue instead of black. Not that one. How impressionistic of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 can't believe I just made that so <laughs> Someone should make a song out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Alex, maybe for those that haven't heard about like how to use black kind of like a blue, do you want to just briefly explain that? Sure, but I was saying, I was saying the opposite though, kind of, that I think I use my ultramarine blue like a black, mm -hmm. and therefore I could just use black, but I would keep cobalt blue, because that's like my blue I actually use as a blue. But yes, um, using black as a blue. I remember in Australia, I was showing Divya's sister like the paintings I believed didn't have any blue in them. Mm. And she was like, no, that's blue. There's blue right there, right there, right there. And like couldn't grasp the concept I was saying that they were using mm -hmm. black as blue and because it's in context of all this warm it appears blue mm -hmm. uh, and yeah i was also looking at a bunch of velasquez paintings and i feel like he is like very good at the whole like when i really look at it i don't s i'm sure there's exceptions but the ones i was looking at i didn't see like any blue it was just kind of like yellow red and black, but it felt like everything that was needed was there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I felt like that was a good example. That's awesome. Were there some Velasquez paintings in Australia? Or were you just talking in... Oh no, this was about, recently, yeah. just like online or in a book or something. Mm. I have not seen many in person. I don't know if I've seen any in person of Velasquez. I don't know if I've seen any either. I don't know if they have any at the National Gallery in DC. In the, uh, the, the Zorn palette though, like the, the use of ivory black as kind of the blue, I mean, you can, um, you know, like if somebody has blue eyes, just having the black with a little bit of titanium white will like match the color perfectly. Or uh, there was one time I was painting a friend of mine while using a Zorn palette. And uh, it was like, I used, I think, black and yellow ochre to paint his green shirt. And it, it looked, you know, it just looked green. I mean, it was a, a desaturated green, but it, it did not look like a dark yellow or something. The black did not make yellow a dark yellow, it made it green. 
See, yeah. there you go. You heard it here, folks. Yeah, white plus black definitely gives a blue color. That uh, I, I, that one like famous self portrait of Zorn's where he's holding the Zorn palette. Yeah, which I think is what the whole Zorn palette thing is based off of. Mm -hmm. It's like now that we have better images of it, you can actually see that there's like one or two other colors. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. really? Yeah. That's hilarious. Like, yeah, I mean, he could have just had that. a brown or something, mm -hmm. but... Uh, Richard gave um, some clarification on where to see some Velasquez's work. He says the Met has some of, of uh, Velasquez's stuff, so... I guess, Alex, if you're going to be up there for for your uh, your show coming up, yeah. stop by the Met, see some Velasquez. I'll be waiting for you. The Met is so awesome to go to. Yep, that is a treat to always go to the Met. Yeah, I would go when I was up in New York um, for a month doing a boot camp at GCA, I would get a pass to go to the Met, and their passes last, I think, like two or three days or something. So I get mm -hmm. a pass Friday evening, like when I got out of the boot camp, and then I spend the next two days there. <laughs> and it was awesome. I got to do a lot of drawing there um, and just observing. I probably spent like a total of 15 hours sitting in front of the boot <laughs> um, That's awesome. But it was a really good experience. Met. Oh, and uh, the Ishashi, I think, is how I'm supposed to say this. Uh, they say that the National Gallery DC has three paintings on view. I assume Velasquez paintings. I see those. Um, I love the National Gallery. And they're saying that this is part of the permanent collection? I guess so. <laughs> That would be good. Yeah. I used to, every year on my birthday, I'd go to the National Gallery because I grew up uh, right outside DC. And every year on my birthday, I'd go there and I'd go sit in the Raphael room. Or at least, I don't think it's called the Raphael room, but they had a lot of Raphaels in there. And sadly, I've not been able to go oh. the last couple of birthdays, but. I've had good birthdays regardless. <laughs> <laughs> they were beautiful then. Yeah, I'm sure Raphael missed me. <laughs> Do you guys have a favorite museum you've been to? Art museum? Ooh. Um, well, I mean, some of the ones that I do love probably the most are, I love the Frick Museum a lot. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, the Met is fantastic. It's huge, though. There's something sort of intimate about the Frick that I love because it's put in the setting that paintings were meant to be in. Mm -hmm. Paintings were not meant to be in museums. They were meant to be in homes. And, you know, they were put in a setting, they were staged, you know. Yeah. And um, the Frick Museum keeps that staging feeling mm -hmm. um, in, in that house. So, now his intention was always that it would end up in turn becoming a museum later. So, so it, the, by design, there's still areas of it that feel more on a showcase level, but um, but that's one of the reasons I like it is because it's the furniture is staged with the art with the with the architecture you know it all works in this harmony. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I love that one so much. Have you seen Exit through the gift shop? Is that what it's called? Or is that the one about Banksy? That's Banks. Okay, have you seen, I think I have seen? There's a documentary about the Barnes collection, 
um, and how there is this beautiful collection of like impressionistic work that was collected by this person and I'm sure I am somebody out there is like screaming at me right now because I'm sure I'm not explaining it exactly correctly but um, <laughs> it um, was very carefully curated to be in this home it was like a home setting mm. um, and then the Philadelphia Art Museum like they kind of imply that they stole the art somehow um, it wasn't like a purchase huh. um, and like then they talked about art being on like white walls and how like yes like I love the fact that I can go to art museums and see art but it, that was not the setting that the art was meant to be in and like this person had curated like every piece that they bought was so curated to fit in their like this home setting and how taking it out of that home setting kind of um, not ruined it but took away a little bit of the integrity of it mm. it's very interesting I forget what it's called but if you can find it it was really good I watched it yeah in, I'm totally in eighth grade. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and uh, Richard uh, said, for, for, uh, for further clarification, the Met has the famous portrait of Juan de Pereja, which I think, I think I know what that one is. And I think that's like, if it's the one I think it is, I think that's like my favorite painting of Velasquez or by Velasquez. That would be awesome. Go back and see that. You almost have to go into the Met with a list of the paintings you want to go see. Yep. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Like almost with strategy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I'd be there for three days. <laughs> but even that, like, was not enough time for it because, like, I spent a lot of time in those, um, reconstructed rooms mm -hmm. you know, that that's part of it and then i spent some time in the m medieval art room even though medieval art is not super up my alley um they had these like little miniature carved things like really intricately carved small little religious objects that had like hundreds of figures and it was like the just the vast just the amount of stuff that they have there is crazy. Not even like to count like the sculptures and it is worth a visit. Every time I keep like working on something else. I'm so distracted by the other thing. I'm like, oh man, there's a lot going on in this painting. <laughs> Got some ground to cover. <laughs> That's how I feel right now. Tina Figarelli says, yay, I made it. Hi everyone. How's it going? Hey. Where's Tina from? Tina, where are you from? I like the last name Figarelli. I actually dated a Figueroa in high school. Makes me think of that. Um, Figarelli sounds like someone I'd be related to. Hey, on my, on my uh, when your Spanish heritage, I don't heritage. Know, it sounds kind of Italian to me. Mm. Figarelli. Figaro, Figaro. Hopefully they're from Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Figarelli. Better watch out for them. Those guys. Next, we're gonna be painting dragon fruit. Yes. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine with me. Yeah. Let's do all the like exotic fruit. No. Can you imagine trying to take pineapple right now? <laughs> Ooh. That would be really hard. Uh, 
Aaron, Aaron V says, hello from St. Louis. And then Tina has replied, from Chicago. And uh, I do have a cousin with the last name Figueroa. Probably no relation, haha. Ha, but yes, it is Italian. Well, she was from the Midwest, so you never know. I went to school in, at Culver Military Academy in Indiana, and she, she was from Wisconsin. So you never know. You never know. All those Midwestern people. So I think she you lives know. in New Orleans now. <laughs> now I'm thinking about it. You gotta love Facebook to keep you up with everybody. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> all I get on my feed now if I look at Facebook or like cooking videos I don't even get anything from like people I know oh I know isn't that something I, feel, I have a theory about Facebook that you when you see people you know it's typically them celebrating either a birthday a wedding or mourning like some some relative or close family member passing and like it's just like all the major events and then past that you don't you don't hear much which is you know because you'll see people you hadn't seen in forever mm -hmm. all of a sudden they'll just pop up and i feel like it's always because you know of a major event life event so that's my theory about facebook like, you know what? It's just too much to get y'all to see everybody in every bit of their lives. So here's the major events. I think they just think that I like cooking videos, which they aren't wrong. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that that's totally true. <laughs> Natal asks, um, watching what you're doing, I've realized that each of you have done different framings of the still life. Was it intentional uh, or did you start to draw and then run out of space? <laughs> it was, <laughs> I can probably say for all of us it was intentional and we didn't accidentally run out of space. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, part of the cool thing about having a still life is, is that you get, to, you get to set your own composition. Um, so, um, I think all of us were like, okay, what would look good at my angle, like compositionally, you know, and that's, man, that's the beauty of art, right? Mm -hmm. You get to make it the way you want to make it. Bob, Bob would be so proud right now. Bob mm -hmm. Ross, mm -hmm. make this painting the way you want to make it. Or no mistakes, just happy accidents. These stokes could use a pet squirrel. <laughs> is this a comment you're making or a comment someone else is making? <laughs> oh, no, this is, this is what I'm saying. I, I think Bob Ross, he had a pet squirrel, right? Oh, that's right. I'm, like, I'm not crazy, right? Okay, okay, just back me up on this. Okay. Like, I was sitting there going, I, man, I'm not following that one. I never saw Watch Bob Ross, but I assumed it was a Bob Ross reference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should get a pet squirrel. There's plenty outside. You just lure them in. <laughs> see, how, see how Rosie handles it. We have, I have a, a sweet little dog. And, you know, <laughs> I, I just think of, like, the dog on Up. She went, squirrel! <laughs> you know, I have a feeling she'd be similar. Squirrels in the backyard. They're a little crazy. A little squirrely. <laughs> a little squirrely. I 
I've been avoiding this bottle for a very long time. <laughs> I didn't even put it in mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you find still life objects that look really nice, but then, and you're like, yes, like that's great for my composition, but then you realize how hard they are going to be to paint. So, I spent, I think, like a week trying to figure out how to draw an ellipse <laughs> for a still life I did a while ago. And since then, I've forgotten. So, <laughs> I did not include my great. full plate in here. <laughs> I love it. On a similar note to Natal's question, so because each of you kind of has your own framing, was there something you were looking at that you were like, oh, that's an interesting aspect of this like setup that I want to focus on or something that, you know, help, you know, helped you choose what your framing was going to be? Um, for me, it was, it was just kind of a balance thing. It's like, I want to try to get this sort of cluster of objects in the piece, but then I want to balance it with this piece of fruit and shadow over on the far right. But I also feel like it has things going off the edge. So, so that's kind of where I was going with, with my composition. Um, but in actuality, now, you know, in hindsight, I still feel like I made it a bit too small. I wanted the same idea, but I, if I were to enlarge it another 10, 15%, I think it would make a better composition with this part of the framing. So instead, I might just cut this uh, panel down. <laughs> did you stick with your 9 by 12, or did you? I did 8 by 10. I should have done oh. a 9 by 12, and then I could have cut it down to an oh. 8 by 10. <laughs> What's the next size down? Um, Five by six, five, five by five, seven. Five isn't by that, seven. Isn't that it looks like this is going to be a fantastic yeah. <laughs> five by seven. <laughs> um, but yeah, comp I guess just I happen to have a very square canvas ready. And then so with having a squarish canvas, trying to find the best kind of composition, for that and I liked the way kind of curving up through the fabric and then over to the cut open fruit over to to this pile of fruit I just thought it looked had a nice S curve and fit the square so yeah yeah I just really wanted to paint the persimmons or not persimmons the <laughs> passion fruit I don't know why persimmons put my mind <laughs> but now I don't really know if I want to anymore because <laughs> these are hard. Um, they're very reflective. Um, not, not super easy. I do love a challenge. We'll see. This turns out to look like at the end here. In a way, I feel like I'm just still sort of blocking everything in, and then I'm gonna like sharpen things up when, when I get really into it. But by that point, live stream will be over. <laughs> We have a, a very technical question and then a, I think, a good question that's not quite as technical. Do you have a, a preference? Like, are you really focused and can't handle something too technical at the moment? Or think, like a technical and, and then conceptual, I guess. All right, all right. Um, so, <laughs> Auntie Auntie, I think that's how you say it, uh, asks, uh, how do you maintain different hue but same value when painting broken color? If I put a couch with a specific value and paint into it with a different hue, it blends into a muddy color. I don't know if that's a question, if that's the case, or if they were just expressing a problem they've run into. Okay. 
Uh, so th th they're wondering about maintaining different hues but having the same value when painting with broken color. So I assume you kind of have like a color and then you are painting broken color over that, uh, which I, I think, Alex, I think you do that a lot. Um, and like, how do you how do you do that without it just blending into one muddy color? Uh, I think I'm understanding you. And I have a lot, like if you're able to zoom in on one of these, there's a lot of broken color, yet I'm still keeping a certain value scheme. Um, if you're trying to put in broken color where at your, it's the right value, but you're changing the hue, and it's just muddying up when you're doing it, maybe you need to use more paint so that the paint can actually just lay down on top of that without affecting, uh, without having anything to do with the color that's underneath it, but just, I mean, it will inevitably a little bit, but just lay on there. Because um, I could see if I didn't use enough paint and I tried to put it on there and then, you know, I decided I wanted to lick the canvas and just kind of like <laughs> pat it, it would just turn to mud. Mm. So yeah, you need enough paint and probably maybe a softer haired brush that will allow you to just lay it on there. Um, yeah, because if it's muddying up, you probably are painting on top of another color. Also, to like get it close to the same value, if you're like working with mixing your color, you know, mix mix your color, your hue, uh, near the same value of the color on your pan palette mm -hmm. that actually is the color that you're wanting to lay it next to for broken color and you'll be able to like get a closer um, or more accurate value before you lay it on there. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I think that's uh, something that's helped me because uh, recently I was working on a portrait and I had the background like a dark warm uh, and I had wanted to make it darker and cooler. And Lewis gave me a challenge. He said, okay, well, you can make it darker if you want, but first try to match the exact same value, but keep, but make it cooler. And, you know, kind of w with that challenge, it actually, you know, ended up having like a, you know, having some broken color naturally just because, you know, they were very compressed, but it was just the temperature difference. And it made the background look really, really interesting and dynamic. Yeah, that, that play of, especially in a background where you have kind of a vibration of warm and cool, mm. really helps. What's, what's the easy question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's, it, it's easier, but it's more, uh, it's, I, okay, so the first one was like very technical, I thought. So, the second one was um, figurative artist uh, Benjamin Lester um, asks, when was the last time you had a painting fail and why did it fail? Which is, I don't think that's an easier question. I think it's, you know, but it's more conceptual, less about like, you know, technical step-by-step -step instruction. -y. You'll see one right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> right now with mine too. <laughs> oh man. Um, I had a painting fail because I dropped it face down on the ground. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, um, very don't true. Be careful with your paintings. <laughs> um, but that was a really good moment for me because um, instead of being having at least like a little bit of my motivation for that painting be like the joy of painting and being thankful for this really wonderful life that I get to live. I was just like, really was like, I need this to sell, like I need to send this to a gallery. And so I wasn't painting with like the right intention. And I also wasn't even enjoying it. Like I wasn't even putting in that much effort into it. Um, so my quality wasn't even that good with it, um, which was disappointing for 
me. Um, but then I dropped it on the ground, face down <laughs> on the studio carpet that I have in my space. And our beloved studio dog, Rosie, likes to hang mm -hmm. out on that ro rug sometimes. So a lot of her fur got into my painting and it just ended up not being something that I saved, but it was for the best because it was more, I guess, like of a life lesson than a painting lesson. Yep. But, you know, in a way, it was just kind of like gave you perspective on the painting and your intention in the painting, yeah. like you're saying, which I love. That it's a, uh, it's almost kind of like it did the hard work for you, which is to to not try to do it in a rushed oh, yeah. format. Oh yeah, I was, yes, I was rushing, I was like stressed. Um, and like there is a time and place to use your time wisely and to like work hard and, um, but I was like just very unhappy with, with the way that it was going and it was a good thing it fell on the ground. <laughs> That's a good lesson story there. I love it. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, I've had some paintings recently that I've given up on. And like partially, I think, there's one side of me that's like, I think that the idea wasn't good enough and I should have maybe had more preparation and thought around it before I just started it. But then another part of me is like, well, maybe you felt too rushed. Like mm. you needed, the thing you were doing needed to be good and it didn't. And to get it to that point, I would have just had to have messed around on it a lot. And I felt like I didn't have the time to do that, so I would, so I've given up on some and put them to the side for that reason. But I think I will go back to them. I mean, a good thought there is like what you're what you're saying is is it's not that the painting failed, but there's there you you reach a point in the painting where you realize that the amount that you'll learn versus the amount of effort you'll put into it is not in the same ratio, is not in the correct ratio. So you're not going to learn enough from continuing to put the effort into it. And it's sometimes better to let go and learn to let go in order for you to actually learn more in a new piece. Um, so there's so many times I, one of my favorite stories is when I was in undergrad and I had a potter who honestly was one of my best teachers I had. And, uh, and I was working on this piece and I said, I want my work to be incredible. He said, okay, well, and I was like, I want you to tell me all the things I'm doing wrong so that I can make it really good. It's like, fine. So he'd come over and I'd show him one of the bowls I'd made and he'd go, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. And I go, okay. And I'd go to start fixing it. And he'd go, wait, 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 what are you doing? I'm going to fix all the things you said wrong. He goes, actually, you're going to spend far more time trying to fix the things that are wrong than you trying to start over and readdress those things that are wrong in the next pot. So I want you to, I want you to crush it. And I was like, I just spent four hours on this pot. Mm. <laughs> and he's like, smush it. And, I, and just like the most painful thing, oh. He just, just crushed the whole pot, and then he was going to start over. And it was just a great lesson to learn because the next pot I made was, you know, a little bit better. And I learned a lot faster, and, it, you know, on and on and on. So the paintings will fail, but usually the reason that we say that, they're, that we leave them is because of the fact that they've kind of reached their end and have served what they were supposed to do for you at that point. Philosophical answer to that. Yeah, <laughs> I will. <clears throat> I totally agree. And I, but I will play devil's advocate and do this, it. Thinking, 
in a different situation that, so I, you know, learned through taking a lot of workshops and stuff. And the one thing that I noticed that was different for me than, and, than most of the other people in the workshops is that they were not willing to spend more than a certain amount of time on a painting. Mm. They would just be like, whether it was after three hours or a couple of days, they just were not would not ever try to push push through. They just kept starting new things, but could never get it to look how they wanted to or finished. Or I mean, that's a good so point. It's a balance. It is a balance. I think you're you're making a great point, which is you know uh, that it's also having the understanding of when you should shift gears and say where that point, that stage is of that you're not, you know, you, you've done 80% of the things and it's going to take, and there's only 20% of the painting left, but that last 20% might cost you another 80% of your time and is the challenge that you're trying to do something you could learn, you know, mm -hmm. faster by not making the mistake at the beginning. So I think, I think you're right because a lot of people give up before they, they've even tried to, so. Yeah, I know uh, recently, actually I think on the same painting I was talking about earlier, lots of problems uh, in my paintings. Um, but I was having certain troubles with like, especially like the shadows. And uh, I think, you know, Louis told me to like, I think scrape it with the palette knife because the shadows were just getting really thick. And so then I, I scraped them a lot and then kind of uh, painted transparently over it to get the shadows. And that created a good division between the shadows and the lights in such a way that uh, taking a painting that maybe would have felt like it was failing in a certain way actually turned out maybe even better than it would have if I had just gotten it from the beginning because it added this interesting texture of the transparent over scraped paint. Yeah, that kind of uh, chaotic feeling that when you kind of mess something up and you have you scrape it down, but you have something still there, and then you paint over it, but some of what's showing through, that yeah, that's a cool can give a really cool look. So we have a uh, quite a few like we we have a handful of comments to get through. Uh, so first off, on this note, uh, Fount Atelier of Fine Arts said, uh, I had a drawing get run over by a car once. The tire marks actually made it more interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see, on a different note, uh, J, first initial J, Nelson, Caroline just uh, uh, says, uh, your sound quality is much better compared to your last live stream. I would like to say, uh, on the other hand, our commentary is as rock bottom as ever. So, you know. Did my dad say that? No, no, I said that. That's me saying that. <laughs> he did not say our commentary is rock bottom. <laughs> That's me saying it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so Tina says, uh, Alex, how is your work for your show coming along? I have a small solo show coming up locally, but I'm wondering how you plan out wall space. Congratulations to Tina, by the way, for that solo show. Tina? Um, the show is coming along. I am basically done with the paintings. I have, I'm like photographing them and stuff now. But as for wall space, because my gallery's done, you know, so many shows and so it's just more of hitting a certain number. And I personally don't actually have um, or don't put in a say of how he arranges the wall space. But 
I'm hoping I've done enough paintings that it fills the wall space well. Oh yeah, I'm sure. No doubts, my friend, no doubts. How do you guys feel about taking a quick break? Yeah, if you want to take a quick break, that's fine. Yeah. We'll probably go another um, 30 minutes anyway, because it, it would easily was, you know, 6.15 or 6.20 before we even got started. Okay. So, um, all right, everybody, we're going to take like a five minute break and then we shall be back. Still applies. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do all nighter that it's not you? It's yeah, it's doing something weird, but it's okay. Uh, that it was doing that earlier. Yeah, it was. But you might but have yes, to I'm getting that exact feeling. Uh, yeah. And I can tell because if I touch my forehead, my finger gets really shiny. Oh yeah, like, my face gets greasy too. <laughs> we'll see if it's up and running. Can I borrow? Uh, yes, you can. as many as you need. Thank you. You're welcome. Use that to dab your face. Yeah. It's, <laughs> That would be funny it, if that's what I did and then just threw it away. You, you I just put it. But like, all right, we're good. Get it there. It doesn't feel very formy because it's so light. But if I were to have this actually be a finished painting, I'd do another layer. Indeed. 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 We do have uh, some questions from before we went on the break. Uh, let's see. So first, uh, Stacy asks, uh, do any of you have favorite composition tools or composition armatures that you tend to use the most, like the Fibonacci spiral or rule of thirds? Um, Fibonacci. No, but... If I am doing a portrait, I like to remember not to leave too much space, but like above the head and the top of the portrait, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sound in the headphone? I don't know if uh, not the sound is... Thank you. That's good because the answer is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, the sound is coming through on there, but it's just... Oh, man. I don't know if that's not working again. Put your both headphones yeah. both in. Okay. You have to answer. I just basically do what feels right. You can hear me. They can hear. No, I can hear. I have to ask them a question, but you can go ahead and answer, because uh, the sound is going through, it's just hard to see what's happening on our end, but they are getting sound, so if you have anything to say about compositional tools, yeah. uh, here's your opportunity. I, uh, 
I've been recently looking into um, what's called dynamic symmetry that I've been trying mm -hmm. to apply to some paintings recently and I forget the the guy's name on YouTube his last name is Glover and he's basically just one thing he does talk about is how the rule of thirds is like a terrible compositional tool. <laughs> and that That's old, a hot take. <laughs> that like old masters do not well, use the rule of thirds. Wow, that's really interesting. So everything I've ever heard about Raphael using the third rule of thirds is wrong. Oh, I'd, I'd be curious. That's really see. interesting. So because there's the rule of there's the rule of thirds where it's like equally spaced, mm -hmm. but then there's that golden ratio of thirds that I know is something different. Okay. Where it's kind of like s smaller, like a smaller cross in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, maybe he was using that, but. Hmm. If you show me a good example, I'll literally send it to him. <laughs> what about this? Huh. Is that something that you read it like you learn about in art history is like the rule of thirds or like the does he talk about like the pyramid? Cause right now in my brain when I think about Raphael, I think about uh, like a pyramid composition, which like I thought was like the same a thing. Triangular. Yeah, which I thought was like the rule of. Thirds. Oh no, rule of thirds oh, is, is like different. Yeah, is like when you have three equal, like thirds this way, and then three equal thirds oh, that way. Oh, oh, so you everything's. Line thing, you oh. try and get things to line up, oh. and it's like stock photography of like. <laughs> an island with a palm tree. It's like the palm tree is like directly on the rule of thirds and yeah. the horizon line is on the, the mm -hmm. third. Well, I remember and like reading through that Andrew Loomis book on creative illustration that Nick introduced me to. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, he talks a little bit about like symmetrical composition and then asymmetrical composition. Um, I'm sure Nick knows more about it than I do. So. <laughs> Nick and I have been troubleshooting, so. Oh, okay. He's just now got back on himself, okay. back online with his headphones. But um, there's something about like not making sure like your your subject is exactly centered and like everything's like there's something about leaving it a little bit asymmetrical that's nice. But then it also depends on like what feeling you're going for because a lot of like if you think of like a lot of religious work with like the Madonna and child like she's in the middle and then he's like sitting on her lap and it's very like frontal in the middle and there's a lot of like power in that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going for something that looks more naturalistic, maybe not do that. Yeah. And yeah. It's like a balancing act, trying to like, like where things just feel balanced. And then something I read in the, or yeah, it was in the Solomon J. Solomon book, talking about this Titian, certain Titian painting. And he says like, there's some figures that get cut off at the edge of the composition. Mm -hmm. And he referenced another painting of like the same subject that someone else did where they didn't Mm -hmm. where everything was completely enclosed in the composition and was showing how the tissue one felt like life was going on beyond the borders of the composition and how like how much better it felt because of that mm -hmm. and yeah so it's like all those little things that you hear of you kind of try and use like I kind of evenly spaced, I feel like the distance between on both sides, my fruit to the edge of the canvas. And I wish I did it a little bit different, but if I can make this plate go off the edge, it'll look a lot better. You know, something about things that are going off the edges that I like. Yeah. I think a common 
beginner mistake is to like want to make everything completely centered and everything in the picture. Um, and I used to do that partially because I was like just excited about the objects that I was painting and I wanted everything to be in there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But there's something very poetic about letting things run off and so it like you like your eye has something to bring you into the picture. Yeah. Yeah, like my piece of fabric that I need to start painting <laughs> before we run out of time. I've just had to come to accept the fact that running out of time is just inevitable. <laughs> I and think just to yeah. keep on going. I think I should have just chosen to do one passion fruit, <laughs> and then I could have been okay. <laughs> But maybe I could have painted that okay. No, it's a great setup. It's a fantastic setup. It's ambitious. And ambitious for our, I guess, about our time, but mm -hmm. it's the artist's job to select, and I just didn't select. I decided, I'm going to paint all of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That is on me. Alex Tabit asks, uh, would you consider compressing values better than using the full range? If so, why? Any tips for successful comp uh, compression? That's a heavy question this late in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that Alex is quite good at doing creating composition with compression in his work. I was, uh, that's funny because I was just saying how Caroline was doing that well. Uh, like with this current setup and how I just went as dark as paint could possibly <laughs> allow me. <laughs> to go dark and went pure white <laughs> on the highlights and there's no compression. <laughs> and now I'm just really, now I don't like it, but. Oh, this is great at that. <laughs> now I suck at it. <laughs> but I think I can do it successfully sometimes in my other works because I creep up on the darks and kind of start them a bit lighter and airier. Yeah. Let that dry and then kind of slightly make them darker over time, but eventually I land somewhere that looks good, um, that isn't too dark and feels compressed. Yeah. You can always make a shadow darker. I mean, I mean, technically you could make it lighter, but if you're looking to keep your shadows rich and transparent, um, if you try to like put opaque like white over it or something or like an opaque color over it to make it lighter it ends up kind of looking chalky so I like to keep my shadows lighter in the beginning because I can always um, kind of add a thin layer over them and still keep them rich Those are good answers all around. I, I only recently begun to figure out how to do compression. Uh, so, so I'm by no means an expert like, you know, the folks that are actually painting, uh, but something but, but something uh, recently that I, I found really helpful was I, I realized like at least within like a, if you're painting just one specific object is to match exactly the color like that, you know, if you're painting into something or right next to something, match the color perfectly and then just add the slightest bit. And sometimes you won't even notice the difference on your palette, but then when you actually put it like on the canvas in the full context, it will like it will actually, you, you can see the difference between the two. 
Yeah, you, that's the, you have to most certainly trust your, your understanding. And then eventually your eyes catch up to it once, once everything's in context. But your, your eyes are constantly computing into your brain of like how to adjust what it's seeing. And if you have like a too bright area in, that doesn't allow for you to be able to see the other differences in your contrast, you know, once everything is much more subtle in its surroundings, you'll then start seeing it. And I think that's a great point, Alex. I mean, uh, Nick, sorry. Getting the audience mixed up with the people that are here. Who is this your microphone on? It sounds like. No, it's not. So, uh, I guess I'll have to repeat that entire profound. I'm joking. Alex's mic, so just... You'll only hear it from me once, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, I do think the, the, the fact of doing something on your palate and knowing you're shifting something, whether yeah. hue or value wise, even though you might not actually feel like you see it, is like an actual breakthrough moment. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can start shifting things and turning form in a way that is like next level. It's like trusting, it's like, I know I just added a darker pigment to it, so it has to be getting darker, even though I can't see it. Oh yeah, and like stepping yeah. back is really important when you're trying to figure oh, out yeah. compression because if you like you can easily um, overdo the difference between like two values shifting or something and like the the whole idea of compression is to make it so that that range is really tight and you could be like noodling really really close up on your canvas and have no idea that Actually, like when you step back, you see that um, they're actually farther apart than you thought that they were <laughs> in value or in chroma or hue. That's a good point. Vicky uh, asks, uh, hi guys, I'm wondering if any of you are using lead white for this still life. I am using a mix of titanium white and lead white. Uh, and that's only because of the fact that right now, um, it's kind of hard to get a hold of lead white. There, there's, they're having a little bit of a manufacturing delay. So, um, so I'm cutting it with this painting a bit. But um, I do love my lead white. I, I use it all the time and really enjoy it. Yeah, right now I'm using titanium. And, but usually I use lead and I'm sort of lucky that I'm at this stage in my show where I, I'm not like, working on so many paintings and more of working on like photographing work because yeah uh, where i buy my lead white is completely out of stock like louis said i don't even use lead white so yep but i am using flake white hue whatever that means <laughs> 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 i'm very knowledgeable <laughs> Does anybody want to clarify maybe what are some of the essential characteristics of lead white that make a big difference between that versus titanium? Um, well, there's a few that I think are important. One, one, it dry, lead white dries really quickly, um, which can be a, a, a nice advantage. Uh, two is that there is a particular type of transparency that lead white has that, that makes it feel quite beautiful. Um, 
Three is that if, if it's a concern to you, um, it, it actually improves the longevity of your painting, uh, your other paint. So it's the most stable paint pigment out there. So it stabilizes um, and helps reduce cracking in the rest of your paint because, of your, because you're using it. So for those reasons, it's, um, it has a lot of just properties that are helpful uh, in the world of painting. But um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of there, if there's any more. Um, there, there are most certainly more. I just can't think of them at the moment while I'm concentrating on this part of the painting. Do y'all know any more? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say if you just got some lead, let's say if you had a pile of lead white and a pile of titanium white and you let them both dry on your palette, the lead white just has this creamier, butterier look to it. Um, so when you're painting flesh and stuff, and even like when you're using thick paint, using lead white, it just has this quality to it that I think looks better than titanium. But some of, some of my favorite, well, one of my favorite painters, Odd Nerdrum, uses titanium and gets a amazing luminous effect, so. Another characteristic that I, I don't think anybody has mentioned is, uh, uh, is, is the fact that it makes it a lot easier to have um, what's the term? I guess impasto, kind of a, get, get like a lot of texture with it. Although some of that is probably in part because it dries so quickly, where if you put a big glob of titanium white, it's, that's going to take like a month to dry. Uh, but uh, yeah, with lead white, I mean, I, I've seen on Alex's paintings, even in his, sorry to, you know, share your secrets, Alex, but um, you know, even on the early stages of the painting where everything is very loose and thin, he's establishing like some thick, you know, sections of paint that from what I can tell he's using, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you use uh, lead white to sort of establish that pretty early on to have like a thick versus thin feeling. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it dries fast is the probably my favorite quality because you can do all that stuff. So many interesting color shifts, even, even though they're subtle, they're, they're all over the place in, in, these, uh, in this fruit, this fruit of passion mm -hmm. that we speak of. So beautiful, this fruit of passion. So like difficult to paint. <laughs> yeah. Sam McLemore says, thanks for all you guys do. And then Dave's story says, looking good, Lewis Carr. Oh, Disco Dave. Disco Dave. <laughs> Dave's story is a, is a high school friend of mine. We went to, we went to military school together. So, hope you're well, my friend. Can he, is he a good at disco? Oh, he, he used to play disco music um, a lot when we were in college. We, I, I actually have fond memories of going around Chicago with him listening to Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. um, so yeah, he inherited the nickname Disco Dave. I have a friend Dave who has a nickname, but it's Pooh Dave. 
Poo Dave. <laughs> Because Dave's not sounding that bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. Day. This is what happens when we paint after 9 p.m. <laughs> <Yeah>. See? <laughs> Painting after dark. Yeah. <laughs> Miss you, Pooey D. <laughs> you better tune in some time. <laughs> See, Disco, it could be worse. Sorry, Dad, that you have to watch this. Auntie <laughs> <laughs> uh, Auntie says, regarding the broken color, I sometimes see subtle value shifts besides the hue shifts within a passage of one value. How to how to do these things without losing form and laying on too much paint. I think it's, uh, does that make sense? Or do you want me to repeat it? Do it one more time. All right, so regarding the broken color, I sometimes see subtle value shifts besides the hue shifts within a passage of one value. Uh, how do you do these things without losing form and laying on too much paint? So I, I think it's like if you look at one section, there might be a very subtle value shift. And, you know, sometimes if you try to put in that subtle value shift, it might, I don't know, take away from the maybe the big shapes or something is what they're asking. It kind of takes away from the form if you are focusing on the little things. So how do you capture the subtle value shifts without losing the big form? That's what I, I think they're saying. Yeah, I guess the value shifts have to be very subtle so that they don't lose the big four. Hmm. Um, I think that was a good answer, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> but like a lot of practice. I mean, that's probably one of the hardest things. Yeah, I guess if you stand far away from it and you can see that value shift, it's probably too yeah, not yeah. compressed enough. If it's truly very subtle, you don't want it to be jarring. Mm. Check it is 920 right now. Okay. Well, that might be my rescue, actually. The, be like, oh, it's done. It's, oh, it's done. <laughs> um, this is the best painting I've ever done. I'm just kidding. I well, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is a good, yeah, this is a good lesson to learn on, on my end. And, you know, on a three-hour piece, make sure I'm not paint, trying to paint everything in the painting. Oh, yeah, um, don't make your fruit three feet tall like I did. At least it feels like it's three feet tall. <laughs> These are probably like they look big, but that's they're a little probably big. life size. It is, and that was too ambitious. All right, y'all. Well, this has <laughs> been uh, a complete blast. We are so glad that Caroline has joined us once mm -hmm. again, and that she set up this beautiful still life. This is a, r truly a beautiful composition um, to paint from. So I hope that y'all use that, the photo references and create some really beautiful work with it. Post, us and post it uh, and uh, tag us at East Oak Studio on Instagram, and we will uh, make sure to try to give you a shout out for participating. But y'all, as always, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be a part of y'all's lives and for us to be in y'all's homes while we sit here and piddle on on these canvases so and have uh, these broken conversations but it's been it's been truly a blast thank you all so much for joining us if you enjoyed this uh, make sure you, you click subscribe and the little bell uh, to remind you that we're uh, going live again 
So uh, we also have a few things, a few artists coming up uh, in the near future. I will be doing a critique night for all of our subscribers Wednesday night. If you are uh, one of our subscribers, please submit your work and I'll be happy to look it over and we'll do a live stream critique night. And uh, sometimes I'll Photoshop some stuff to give you ideas how you can improve the work. Um, also, uh, next month, the, I believe it is the, I think, believe it's the 20th of next month, we will be doing um, a Portrait Society uh, critique night as well. So uh, put that also down in your calendars. It'll also be on our East Oaks calendar. And uh, we also have um, Elaine Bossa coming in to do a landscape tutorial next month after that. So lots on the calendar. We're looking forward to seeing you again. We will be doing another one of these, like we try to do them once a month or so. And uh, without further ado, y'all have a wonderful evening and thank you for watching.